Hi, everyone. Thanks for your patience. We're going to start Lessons from the Field, Comparing Single Access Tracker Technology. So my name is Yuri Reznikov. I run uh, products and strategy here at Sunlink, uh, responsible for what these products look like, feel like, roadmap, how we launch into market. And with me, I have uh, Daniel Terrico, who is uh, the man who designed the Viasol tracker and really expert on all things tracking. Um, and together, we'll go through a couple of things on the tracker side to give you an idea of um, how to choose the right tracker products and some of the things that you should consider. So this is what we'll talk about. Um, I'll start out with first describing the opportunity very briefly. I think most folks are aware trackers have been becoming a more important piece of the overall uh, mix in terms of technology and ground mount and utility scale projects. And there's a very good reason for that because they just seem make more and more sense. And then I'll hand it off to Daniel to talk a little bit about those, the components and the differences when it comes to single access trackers. When you're looking at various technologies, when you're considering utilizing different technologies in your projects, what are some of those things that you should take a look at that you consider in terms of uh, potentially cost, installation, O&M, um, and some of the features that um, may not be so obvious make a big important difference when you're choosing a particular technology. And then I'll talk a little bit about the Sunlink Viasol tracker. Sunlink made an acquisition of Viasol a couple of months ago, and we're very excited to bring this tracker to the market. Um, the tracker has been in existence since 2008. There's been about 75 megawatts of this tracker deployed, so it's by no means a new product, but it's certainly um, a new product with the Sunlink name going out to the market. And then we'll do a Q&A at the end. Um, feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A box, as you can see on the slide. Um, feel free to type those questions in throughout the presentation. If there's a particularly relevant question, we may um, interrupt um, and answer that question at the time. Uh, but most certainly, we will um, absolutely try to get to all of the questions at the end. And if we can't, um, then we will most certainly respond by email to each and every question. So feel free to type in the questions throughout the presentation as you think of uh, questions to ask, and we will try to get uh, through all of them by the end of the presentation. So a little bit about Sunlink. Uh, we've been in the industry for 11 years. Uh, we've done about 700 megawatts at uh, a couple thousand sites um, throughout the U.S. We've also done a number of projects in Canada. Sunlink really started out as a leader in the commercial rooftop space, and we have since transitioned or expanded into the fixed tilt racking space and have been successful there with the utility and commercial projects. And now we're, again, expanding into the tracker market with the Viasol acquisition. So let's talk a little bit about the market and why this makes sense. It's really becoming a better opportunity than, than before. Um, and there's a couple of points, and I'll quickly breeze through these, but I, I think most folks know that, look, it's just more energy production. In a lot of cases, about 20%, but even if we go up north and we have a couple of installations in Canada, we're seeing 10, 10 to 15% additional energy production there. And if you go down south, then you're able to maybe squeeze out an additional 25, if not more, from a single axis tracker. That's, that's considerable. And what's driving that, or those installations, those numbers, is the decreasing costs. And really, the decreasing costs, uh, everything in the solar industry, from technology, panels, um, balance of system, have been decreasing. But the delta between the fixed rack systems and the tracker systems have been decreasing significantly, to where that was a, a very big difference, not only from an equipment cost perspective, but also installation costs and O&M costs. Now we're seeing a single-digit delta, which makes it much more palatable when considering between the fixed rack system and a tracker system if it's in the right area with the right land cost and the right PPA. It's really a no-brainer uh, to go with a tracking system, which brings me to the next point of improved quality and reliability. This was another hiccup that I think the industry saw maybe five years ago where folks were really focused on fixed tilt systems. There wasn't a lot of familiarity with trackers of these moving components and electrical components that have to be in the pretty harsh conditions in some cases for the next 20 and 25 years. 
There's see the industry has gotten comfortable with that. We've had trackers in the U.S. in these various conditions for a long time. Um, and depending on the product, some have been very, very successful at high quality um, and very reliable. Um, this is a similar kind of transition that Europe went through where they were on the fixed tilt side and got comfortable with trackers um, a couple years ago or five to ten years ago. And we seem to be in the U.S. on a very, very similar path. And then the last point I'll quickly talk about is, the, is really the, the map of the energy production. Um, I think the common term is uh, really the expansion of the shoulders when you're looking at that energy graph. You're basically, it's a little bit of a flatter curve with a tracker. You're able to maximize production of energy exactly when it's needed. So a little bit more in the afternoon, a little bit more in the mornings, and it's a flatter curve. So, which is an advan advantage when you have time of use, um, requirements uh, in your PPA or from the utility, and the utility that likes it as well because that's when it needs the energy also. So the graph down below, um, and it may be a little bit tough to read, but the fact of the matter is if we're looking at revenues in the billions of dollars between 2014 and 2019, fixed still, still commands a, a large part of the market worldwide, but you can see the share of tracking technology, specifically on the single axis tracker, more than double throughout that time. People are getting more comfortable with the quality and the reliability of those models. They see the benefit of that additional energy production and the decreasing cost just make those a lot more palatable. So we're excited to bring this product into the market. We think it makes absolute sense for our customers and for the industry. And so with that, I'll pass it on to uh, Daniel to do a tracker technology overview and talk a little bit about some of the components. Hi, Yuri. Thank you. As uh, Yuri mentioned, I was the architect behind the, the Biosol, um, now Sunlink Biosol tracker. I um, spent a few years developing that product, certainly with an eye to the competitive market space and, and other um, details that we might have incorporated in that design. And what I'd like to talk about is just to give you an overview of, of the different kinds of tracker features that are out there and uh, um, some insight into what it is you'll be looking at when you're looking at buying a tracker. Um, for starters, um, you know, there's some, some, all the trackers do essentially the same thing. They're going to move the modules back and forth, um, these single axis trackers, east-west during the day. And as long as they have backtracking and are reasonably reliable, they're all going to produce about the same amount of energy gain for the power plant. So in that sense, they're really not differentiated. <clears throat> I know there's been some claims to the otherwise, but really they're doing the same thing and, and should be creating the same result. So what you're really looking for are, are differences in detail. Um, and wh what we like to focus on is discussion of constructability, meaning how easy is that thing to put together um, on site? How reliable is it? is it? Is it performing as expected? Is it requiring a fair amount of service? Um, how long live will it be? Meaning um, is it expected to break down frequently or is it expected to bring, break down um, or to last for a very long time? And ultimately, we, 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 when you're looking at solar power plants, you're looking at the levelized cost of electricity. Uh, another term that comes up is long-term or total cost of ownership, life cycle cost of ownership, things like that. So all of those kind of figure into the, the purchase decision um, for, for the person who's deciding what, what technology to deploy on their site. Ultimately, for the, for the project owner, it comes down to it's, it's a risk factor. And as Yuri mentioned, a lot of... Uh, Power plants were built with um, fixed racks because there was some unfamiliarity and just some um, uncertainty about trackers and, and how that impacted the risk profile of those power plants, um, despite the fact that there was a very significant energy gain to be had for you know a relatively small marginal cost. Um, these days, I think that risk, people have a much better understanding of that, but there's still a lot of that is embedded in the details of the different uh, trackers that are out there. Going into it, I think there's, there's a lot of things they have in common. We'll, we'll talk about that. You have to mount modules in a way that, um, that is similar to fixed racks, and you have to, have to be able to rotate those modules um, on those racks. And so if you look at a, a, a tracker, you're, you're going to have generally rows of modules, and you have to mount the modules onto a support structure, which in, in pretty much every tracker is going to be a tube that runs down the middle of the tracker row. That tube is rotated back and forth during the day. It has to carry uh, twisting forces in the wind. Um, 
back generally to the middle of the row where it's held in place um, when the wind's blowing. And it's also used to rotate that tube. Of course, to rotate the tube, it can't be bolted down, so it needs some sort of bearing um, in, in to, to allow for it to rotate. And of course, I think you're all familiar with that, you need to have some sort of support post to keep it above the ground. So really, that's the basic four elements of a tracker row that essentially every tracker is going to have. And some of these photos, by the way, are, are legacy um, sites that uh, we've worked on over the years and, and just kind of um, some of these products really aren't on the market at all these days, but just um, selecting from these to kind of give you examples of what, what has been out there and what is out there in the marketplace. Um, thing that stands out that is real significant difference in, in the trackers that are now on the market is, is the approach to the bearing. Um, very common design, one of the earlier designs of trackers was to use a large diameter journal bearing. Uh, again, this is um, a design from probably 15 years ago, but I still see it around today <clears throat> um, in different uh, and improved configurations. But in this case, the tube that it's, it's twisting, um, the torque tube, is mounted with a bearing around it and it has some sort of support for that bearing. Um, I, I meant, listen, a couple of advantages here. It's a pretty simple, easy to understand type of design. I, I mentioned that high friction is actually can be an advantage in some cases because it's like having a damper built into the bearing, which you don't necessarily want. It's a bit like driving with the brakes on. But when people worry about oscillations and things like that, having a, a kind of high friction bearing might actually work to the advantage of the design. Disadvantage, of course, is that um, that high friction is like driving with the brakes on and, and your, your precision of tracking will be lower. Uh, they also, because the center line of the bearing is kind of low um, the, and the modules are high, these trackers are always a bit top heavy. And so as they start to go over, you know, you're rotating those trackers, it wants to continue tipping and if you let that thing go, it's going to go all the way down and crash. Um, these are a little bit costly um, because they're big and they are heavily customized. So you can't just go, if this thing wears out in 10 or 15 years, and that, uh, that particular part is no longer in production from the supplier that originally made it. Um, and those molded parts are made um, specifically for one part of your person. Um, you're not going to be able to get those. So um, again, there's, there's trade-offs to be had in each one of these designs. Another common configuration I call the row balance design. In this case, you're, you're basically swinging the torque tube in, in a space and suspending it from above. And so the bearing is mounted above the torque tube. <clears throat> um, there aren't many variants of this out there, um, though there are, have been some uh, tested over the years, you know, dating back probably 20 years. But um, the advantage here is that, you know, if you ever have to repair that, well, well the thing wants to swing to a level position when it's, when it's not got wind blowing on it or it's not under a load. So, so it's a little easier to work on it. Um, it's going to have relatively low drive forces, particularly if it's, it's designed so that it's, it's more or less balanced. And it's going to be a bit more stable in the wind than the designs that use the large journal bearing because the, the mass is now lower and hanging below instead of swinging up above. Um, the disadvantage, as you might imagine here, <clears throat> is if you look at that, uh, that, that uh, bearing, <clears throat> you can see that it's not that easy to assemble it. It's a little bit complicated. And you also have to leave a gap at each bearing which means you're going to have a little bit uh, less efficiency in your land usage and have longer rows overall and uh, a bit more material and land and wire out there that you have to incorporate into your design. The last type of configuration that, that we discuss is what, what I call an array balance design. In this case, the, um, the, the bearing is actually not above or below or around the torch tube. It's off to one side. And what that, what that creates is, is an individual tracker row that really wants, is off balance and wants to go in one direction. And to make an, a balanced array is you simply put essentially equal numbers of rows or near equal numbers of rows and mirror image them so one half of the array wants to go one way, one half the other, and they're linked together so that they're essentially having a, a bit of a tug of war and it keeps the entire array, array um, balanced. What this gives you um, a relatively Simple um, maintenance, if you have to maintain the drive system, it, it's quite stable in the wind. And it also allows you a relatively uh, simple means of installation because you don't have obstructions or things like that that you have to thread through. Um, disadvantage to this is that you 
you know, the, because the rows are biased to one side, they, you do need a, a lock pin in them during installation. Those are, those are removed during uh, commissioning. And, and you also, the individual rows are biased, so you don't want to free up one row all by itself. They are individually adjustable, but, um, but, but they do want to drop to one side. Now, besides the, the, the bearings, you know, you have to have some means to, to move the, the tractor rows. And so, really, there's two basic uh, types of configurations for for the actuation. Um, and similar to inverters, what you have is cent either central actuation, where you have uh, one controller, one motor, one actuator moving a whole bunch of rows that are linked together, or you have what's called distributed actuation, where you have a single motor on each row, and the rows are independent from one another. You have a controller on each row, or, or wires running to it. And there are really advantages and disadvantages to each, each of these, and we'll go into that. Um, for distributed actuation, again, um, what you will see out there in terms of machinery is either a slew drive or a linear actuator. Usually you're, you're going to have just one per row. Um, and the real advantage to these is if you have a very uneven site, a crooked boundary or things like that, you can tile them in and fill the site very efficiently. Um, if you have uneven terrain, same thing, they, they can be at different angles. Um, as long as you can manage the shading issues, that works out. The, the real disadvantage that stands out, frankly, is, is, is more than anything else is really the reliability. I mean, you're going from perhaps one to three or four motors per megawatt to, you know, as many as 60, and suddenly you have, you know, 20 to 40 times as many parts and pieces and electronic controls and things that have to be maintained and have to be operational for a long time. You, you know, you, you end up with a higher initial cost due to that higher parts count and more cabling typically and, and um, a higher maintenance cost. But the other thing that stands out is that you'll, in, the, in practice, what is, has been seen and experienced is that you actually get a more lost production from the distributed actuation systems. And it's because, you know, you'll have, a, individual rows that are down, you can't really justify a truck roll to send a technician out there, it's quite expensive, um, for a single single uh, row tracker, and so they'll, they'll leave a number of them down for quite a while, and then they'll eventually get around to fixing them. And so the net result is that even though you only have smaller parts down at any one time, um, averaged over time, you end up with a greater production loss. <clears throat> when you talk about central and ganged actuation, um, you can get to very large arrays, and you know, the photo off the side there, um, there's some arrays that's, that's a central actuated system um, with arrays that are greater than 800 kilowatts each on, on the large side. Um, the rows are linked together, usually via a, a prop shaft if you're transmitting mechanical energy that way, or just a simple linkage, push-pull. I, I could name some names there, but I think you're all familiar with, with the um, brands that are out there um, deploying those particular configurations. The, um, the real advantage to central actuation, kind of like with central inverter, is that you just have far fewer things to maintain, and the mathematics of, of reliability is fewer is better. Um, you know, once you have fewer of them, you know, you gain economies of scale, so you have a expected initial lower cost, um, but you get reliability simply because you have fewer parts to maintain, but also, once you have fewer, you can invest a lot more in using ruggedized parts that are well tested, are thoroughly engineered and proven, perhaps industrial grade components that are you know, developed for applications outside the solar industry. And ultimately, you kind of get a double, sort of double whammy there where you not only have fewer parts, but you have better parts. And it really plays out in, in terms of developing a system that's made to go the distance. Um, the disadvantage to gang systems is typically, especially with push-pull arrays, they do need to be rectangular or close to rectangular for those systems to work, and um, and they're not as adaptable to uneven site boundaries, even with the, the prop shaft type uh, <coughs> type systems. Um, and also with a push-pull type uh, linkage system, you know, the, the wind forces aggregate over the array, and though there is some balancing of those forces, um, you do have some relatively large forces that have to be anchored to the ground at the drive, and so you do end up with one, one you know, fairly large drive foundation at each array. Now, that's just the actuator configurations. When you start looking at the actual machinery and um, mechanism used to, to move the, the tracker, there's some pretty significant differences there as well. And um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. Um, 
One of them, I think this is quite common, is what is known as a slew drive, um, where when we talk about a prop shaft, um, you have uh, a motor or a propeller shaft that's driving a worm gear, and there's an example there in the lower right-hand corner um, to give you a sense of how that works. Um, it turns that with that worm gear that drives a big big ring gear, and it, allow, it rotates the row, and that's what's hooked to the, to the tracker row. You know, the advantages there is that, that they are structurally more efficient. The forces are anchored to the ground right there at each row. You don't have the, the back feed forces that you get with a, with a push-pull system. And, um, you know, it it's, is kind of nice. And it also allows you to, to tile in arrays um, a little more efficiently if you have uneven boundaries or things like that. And the disadvantages really are that, that as you can imagine, the slew drives themselves have a fairly high initial cost. I think. These days in volume, they've managed to reduce that pretty significantly, but still that is an expensive part. And they're not the kind of thing that you can just buy out of a catalog or off the shelf. They're really made to order, um, generally supplied to the guys who are buying them in volume. And so, um, you know, if, you, if, you, if those do wear out or damaged or broken, they're not going to be widely available and they would be quite expensive to source. Um, <clears throat> another common, common bit of machinery used to move trackers is, is a screw jack. Um, typically, in the push-pull arrays, you'll see a, a heavy screw jack is, is, is probably been deployed on, on, for, frankly, gigawatts of tracking systems at this point in time. Relatively easy to understand a bit of machinery. You have a motor and a gearbox again, and, and just a linear screw that, that moves back and forth. They are um, not uncommon in industry, and in they're suitable for the duty cycles you see in trackers, which are back and forth once a day. Um, so, you know, you'll see them in slow-moving equipment. Again, they're not very widely available. You will be able to find them in catalogs, but they're typically made to order, and they are not cheap. Um, so, you know, again, from a long-term risk perspective, you know, sourcing those can become um, a risk for the long-term owner, and they are fairly expensive to replace if, if and when they do fail. Something you see with the single-row trackers, um, with the uh, distributed actuation trackers, and, and these are common both in two and one axis, are, are small linear actuators. They're very similar to a screw jack, except that they um, just produce much smaller forces. Um, they can be quite inexpensive. You know, the advantage that, to this approach that you'll see with the distributed actuation, um, you know, small actuators, is that, that you have a low cost, relatively easy to buy part, and it's easy enough to replace them as they fail. You know, the disadvantage really is that um, they are expected to fail. And so the, the typical model for the distributed actuation um, systems, particularly those using in your actuators it, that I'm familiar with, is that they, they expect them to fail and they just expect to go replace them every so often. Again, that's where you start seeing um, sort of the management of downtime becoming a real, you know, a real thought process for the, the O&M provider. Last method that, that we'll discuss is, is what we call a fluid power drive, um, or it's a hyd hydraulically actuated system. And th the advantage to this, this approach is that it really mimics what's used, frankly, in heavy industry all over the world. So it's, it's, it's used in an efficient, reliable way to make very large forces and, and really quite cost effective for what it can do. It allows you to get to um, a very large arrays. They kind of they give you the economy, the scale, and reliability. I think that that uh, you know a true you know industrial scale, utility scale power plants are expected to deliver. They are quite rugged, of course, because they're designed for outdoor use, even underwater use, and and they benefit from an established global supply chain and knowledge um, maintenance knowledge base that's it, out there pretty much all over the world because they're used for you know pretty much everything under the sun. But I'm sure you're familiar with them. Um, the disadvantage to this approach really is that you know they don't scale down very nicely. If, if you're you know trying to do smaller systems, um, you know things below a half megawatt, um, you know start to look you know not not as favorable in terms of economics, and um, you know you need some regular preventive maintenance probably on a, a you know every two years or so you expect to service those systems, um, and uh, you know it's not something that electricians necessarily are familiar with. So, so that's really the, the, what I have to say about the, the, the drive systems, um, which is sort of how they're configured and the kind of machinery that's deployed out there. But the other element of every tracker that distinguishes it from 
from fixed racks is that they need some sort of electronic control to, to tell the tracker when to move and how far to move and, and how to position the modules. And, and there are some some differences in those as well that, that play out you know, in the in the near term and the long term. Um, what we have are two basic configurations. One is a custom control board and the other one are boards based on industrial automation um, programmable logic controllers. So the custom control boards, you see them in the distributed actuation systems more more often because because they can be very inexpensive. Right? You can you can build that onto a small, you know, um, customized electronic board. Um, as long as they're made by the tens of thousands, um, they can be quite cheap, and and you, they need that really for the distributed actuation systems to make economic sense. Um, they kind of um, again, as I mentioned, with the small linear actuators, they have more or less a break and replace model where instead of trying to get, you know, expensive and ruggedized industrial equipment, you use something that, that you expect to last for some years. Um, if it does fail, you know, you expect to go out and swap it out with another relatively inexpensive part. The real disadvantage there is that it's it's not that easy to achieve long-term reliability from electronics. I know we do amazing things with our cell phones, but we also swap them out every two to three years. And um, you know they benefit from the fact that they're made by the hundreds of millions, not by the by the hundreds or thousands. Um, and and what has been the experience in the industry, you know, dating back a decade and a half, is that many custom control board suppliers have come and gone, and they leave their their technologies orphaned when they when they when they exit. And so um, so there's some real risk for the long-term owner that in 10 or 15 years' time, which is frankly a very long time in the world of business, um, that those those long-lived assets will be missing critical um, spare part. The other approach that, that you'll see probably on, on, frankly, a majority of the trackers that are now deployed out there, um, particularly um, the, the centrally actuated ones, are control boards that use a programmable logic controller, a PLC. Now the advantage to this, and you look at it and say, well, it kind of looks pretty, um, you know, you got wires in there and you got a lot of big bits of equipment and that's true, but the advantage really is that you know, each of the components you see in there is supplied by uh, probably a global manufacturer. And in this case, you're looking at stuff by ABB um, and IDEC or PLC manufacturers, but, but big global manufacturers that the components individually are very thoroughly tested to industrial standards. And they're all field swappable. So if anything ever fails, it's usually a matter of a screwdriver uh, maybe a pair of pliers for a technician to just go swap it out um, with a new component and those components, though they are perhaps you know a little pricey for what they're doing compared to say what we do with a cell phone, um, they're still only in the hundred you know to four hundred dollar range. So so they're really um, highly maintainable, um, very durable kind of ruggedized components expected for plan for use in, in industrial applications. They are also, I think, have the advantage of being obsolescence proof. You can add features to them, you can upgrade them with backwards, you know, compatible um, new new technology. And so th this approach um, gives some assurance that there's going to be a long-term plan to support support the product and, and to be able to even upgrade the product as new, new features are desired. Um, and also, you know, from a maintainability standpoint, again, you don't need highly specialized technicians. Um, if a part is needs swapping out, you know, it can be done fairly, fairly quickly and easily. And you, you have the option there to, to to connect that via, you know, on the internet and SCADA systems, which are, are becoming very important as solar becomes a part, a real part of the electric grid. And utilities, you know, take this as a serious part of their power production fleet. Um, they really are requiring that they can manage it, these systems from their remote control rooms and their central control rooms. Um, the real disadvantage to the PLC approach is that they are it's a costly control board. It has to be um, assembled from again industrial grade components, and there's you know a fair amount of labor and cost that goes into to assembling these boards because they are made in relatively low numbers. The other element to the tracker that you see is you have to have a control sensor so you can you can actually tell where the tracker is and tell it what to do. Uh, the most common approach now is the inclinometer. In the past there have been light sensing controllers that have been deployed. Um, they haven't proven to be highly successful, a little bit high maintenance. 
seems like the whole industry now has moved to an inclinometer type uh, control feedback where it measures the position of the tracker row. And um, then the, the PLC or the custom control board calculates that the correct position and sends a signal to the, the actuator system to move it to where it needs to be. Um, it's proven to be a fairly reliable way to run a tracker. That's, that's mostly what you're going to see out there um, in the market these days. So that, that's what I have to say about the, the general, you know, elements and components of a tracker and what's now available in the market. I think um, as you're out there um, looking at those, or I'm sure many of you have experience actually installing them, um, you've probably seen a lot of these components, but this just gives some context about that. So when you're doing uh, comparisons, you can kind of compare, you know, side by side, feature by feature, element by element to see what it is you're really getting into. And with that, I'll hand the, this back to uh, Yuri Reznikov to discuss the, the Sunlink uh, Viasol tracker and, and um, the specific features of that. Thanks, Daniel. Um, so what I wanted to do is I want to talk a little bit about um, the product that Sunlink uh, is actually putting out to the market. Um, clearly, this is, uh, this is Daniel's product. He designed it, but I thought um, Daniel did a great job of going over some of the benefits uh, and potentially disadvantages of some of the systems out there. Um, and what I believe is uh, he's really taken kind of the best in the industry and put it together into a tracker that makes a lot of sense from uh, a couple of different perspectives. So th this is really the tracker. Um, it doesn't look any, any different than I think what you'd see from any other tracker. Um, it is, uh, it's a single axis tracker. Uh, the modules can go into one in portrait or two in landscape depending on the, on the requirements um, of the project. Um, it is a fluid drive, so it is a hydraulic system, which we believe um, offers a, a number of advantages. Um, <clears throat> and Daniel's also been able to integrate some of those kind of installation features or O&M features um, into the tracker. So I'll talk about two main things. One is kind of the cost side, which always comes up, not only from the equipment cost, uh, but also the installation and potentially the O&M. And then the other one is really about um, lowering that risk, and it's about you know, quality and reliability um, and making sure that these trackers are, stay out there for 20, 25 years without any problems. So the reason we're, we're fairly excited about this Viasol tracker from a cost perspective, as, as I think we've talked about, there's one controller, one drive per megawatt. So that, that's a disadvantage if you're looking at projects that are on the small side. But anything a megawatt or over, now you get into a situation where you're saving considerable costs from not only from an equipment perspective, since again, you're using one controller, one drive, it comes as a package, you bolt it on and you're basically done with that entire setup. Uh, but it also helps with the reliability and uh, quality and, and the rest of it since you only have one piece there. The other piece is uh, clearly it saves on the installation cost as well. So not only on the hardware cost, but also from an installation perspective, there's a significant cost savings there. The other piece is from a cost perspective, as, as you can see there on the slide, is number one, it's fewer foundations per megawatt, what we typically see out into the industry. Uh, typically, the projects that we see with the Viasol tracker um, are less than 500 uh, foundations per megawatt. Um, we think that's, uh, that's a big advantage in terms of not only lowering the risk of putting piles into the ground where uh, maybe you run into some obstructions, maybe there's some rocky terrain, you don't really know until you get out there. So by minimizing that number of foundations, not only are you minimizing the material, you're minimizing the labor, but most importantly, you're minimizing the risk of the geotech report that uh, may or may not have captured everything that's in the ground. The other two points is kind of on the alignment tolerances and the self-aligning connections. The, these really two come hand in hand, and what we've seen in the kind of through our experience on the fixed tilt side or even on the roof mount side, anytime something is not perfect, whether that's the terrain or the posts aren't installed perfect, it really becomes a challenge to install a particular product and make sure that it works easy without any you know, concerns or being able to use a jig or fit things into place. The tracker that Daniel designed, um, it has the widest alignment tolerances and the connection self-aligns. So no matter if you're off by a little bit on your post, the installation crew can put the components in place, they automatically align, you don't have to take time to find bolts, you don't have to squeeze and 
try to maneuver different parts so that they all fit. They really just put into place and there's enough tolerance there, enough ability so that things very easily snap into place. This is a huge advantage from a labor perspective in terms of putting this thing out there, getting it installed, not having to fight with the terrain, or in the worst case scenario, actually having to remove some of the foundations, putting them at a different angle, or um, trying to squeeze things, bend metal, and then have the tracker potentially not operate as it should. Um, the other piece that I mentioned I wanted to discuss is the risk mitigation. Um, and really, this tracker, another huge reason why we were so attracted to this technology is, uh, first of all, it's been out there in the field since 2008. As I mentioned, there's 75 megawatts of this technology deployed. So we wanted something um, that we knew was work, that was a proven technology, that wasn't something new that we were putting into the market that was untested. Um, and one of the ways the Viasol uh, folks and Daniel got there was they used off-the-shelf components. So one of the reasons that we like the hydraulic drives, as to use as an example, is because, again, you can order them from any catalog, whether you're doing projects um, in the Middle East, whether you're doing projects in South America. Everybody's familiar with hydraulics. Everyone's familiar with how they work. They've been around for a long time. It's not necessarily that you have to go out there and get some special expertise. You not only can get the equipment if something happens, but you can also get the expertise to fix it, install it. And this technology has been proven. So if something's operating in the field for 20, 25 years, and it's in the desert and some windstorms and harsh environments, we have a high degree of confidence that the hydraulic system is going to withstand that. Because guess what? It's, it's withstood that in other uses and other technologies, and it's been around for a long time. So that's, that's just one piece why we like certain uh, features of this tracker. The same goes for the controller. The same goes for some of the kind of in the metal components, where they're off the shelf, they're easy to get. Ten years from now, um, you don't have to think about, hey, do I need inventory? How much capital do I need to spend sitting in a warehouse to make sure that ten years from now I have enough spare parts? These components are not going away. They were designed in such a way that customers have the capability to uh, basically have those products or have those components uh, 10 years from now um, or what have you. Again, I mentioned uh, that it's been around for a while now. Uh, you can see some of the projects that were deployed here. Um, this tracker has been deployed in a lot of different environments. It's been uh, deployed up in Canada, so very harsh conditions with respect to snow and winter. It's been deployed in uh, areas such as Arizona, which is kind of the typical place you see trackers in. And the other thing I want to mention is it's 75 megawatts, but it's not that particular tracker technology that was the first installation. This tracker is at its ninth iteration. So the Viasol team, over the years, they did the first installation and they've continued to improve on that tracker technology, whether that means lowering costs, optimizing components, optimizing the installation process, increasing the reliability, you know, thinking through what is it going to take to get a product out there for our customers that is cost-effective, easy to install, it's going to last a long time, and provide the necessary features that make it above and beyond the most competitive product in the market. And so out of those nine iterations that this product has been through, that's what I think we've accomplished here. So we're very excited to bring this this product to market as something. So that's, that's basically the end of the presentation. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a couple of things. We'll get to Q&A in a second. Uh, but you can see we have a Sunlink warehouse and a training facility. Um, I want to invite everyone who's online to come and visit us. Um, email uh, the number there if you'd like to visit the facility, if you'd like to do some hands-on training. We have not only uh, the tracker set up, functional and working, which you can take apart, put it back together, understand the implications of how the different pieces go together. We also have some of our roof mount products, our fixed tilt products. You can kind of get an idea of our product portfolio, get an idea of what it takes, uh, ability to uh, kind of touch and feel the different products, and we'll have a training program around that. So if anybody's interested or if you'd like more information on that, uh, please send a, either to an email to webinar at Sunlink or sales at Sunlink. Uh, we'll be sure to respond uh, right away uh, if there's any interest there.